Welcome to Gamecock Pod Live. For the next three to four years, I'll be committed to the University of South Carolina. This is Rodgers again to the 25, 20, 15, 10. Rodgers scores! Jackie Bradley Jr. delivered for the Gamecocks. Lost it up, looking for Kelly. And South Carolina is sending shockwaves through the SEC. Where's it at the buzzer? That's a win! Unbelievable! I don't believe it! And now, live from Studio 54 of the Gamecock Pod Studios, here's the cockfather himself, Keith Alsep. All right, everybody, welcome in to Gamecock Pod Live for January the 17th, episode number 1395, where I am battling an upper respiratory infection and am hopeful to be able to make it through the show without coughing up gross stuff or coughing in general. But we've got a great show for you. A lot of stuff happening. Uh, we'll break it all down with our good friend, the sports director at WLTX 19 in Columbia and the 2022 South Carolina Sportscaster of the Year, Chandler Mack, will be joining us in just a few minutes. Go ahead and jump into the chat box brought to you by Nana's Porch, an award-winning full-service catering company servicing the greater Charlotte area, whether it is a wedding, a banquet, a barbecue, end-of-the-year bash. Maybe you just want to have a weekend party with the whole hog barbecue. Nana's Porch has got you covered. Get in touch with my good friend, Chris Payne. They have their award-winning pimento cheese that is mm, mm, good. Not only first place or the best, according to the North Carolina Specialty Foods Association, but number one and number two in the meat and cheese specialty category with the smoky jalapeno, which is my personal favorite. At number one, and the regular flavor coming in at number two, get in touch with my good friend Chris Payne at nanasporch.com. Jump in the chat box. Leave your questions there for Chandler and myself. And your news notes and headlines are brought to you by Nana's Porch. So here we go. Gamecocks. Last night, dropped a very disappointing home loss in men's basketball to Georgia, 74-69. to Gamecocks dropped to 14-3 and 2-2, and, two and, two, and so they give, they give the road win back. That's essentially what happens, but that counted as a quad three loss because it was at home. And it's quite frankly a very average Georgia team that South Carolina had no business losing to. They couldn't throw it in the ocean, standing knee deep in it. And yes, the officiating was an issue, but the bottom line is you can't miss a bunch of layups. You can't miss 15 free throws and in the second half go through a stretch where you are two for 11 from the free throw line for the first 15 minutes and 26 seconds of the half. Two for 11. I mean, I can make two for more than two for 11 blindfolded 
okay, with my eyes closed. It just was not the Gamecocks night. Gamecocks took a nine-point lead at 48-39 to 39 with 14.05 remaining. And Georgia went on a 16-2 to two run. The Gamecocks went almost seven minutes without a field goal. And um, they never recovered from that uh, run by Georgia. Michi Johnson got them close. There's a very questionable call that was upgraded. Uh, I mean, it was a senseless foul by Michi. The ball was an air ball. He didn't have to touch the guy. The guy kind of flopped. Um, they called it a flagrant. George only made one free throw, but then they end up getting a bucket. So it was a, still a three-point possession. And... Um, you know, uh, Ray Finkel with us. Ray, I agree that, you know, you're going to lose some home games, right? And so getting the road win against Missouri was big. Um, even though they were number 118 in the net. But, man, you are really making hay if you get that Georgia win. You're 3-1 and one in SEC play. You don't give back the home uh, the road win, which is basically what you did last night. Quite frankly, nobody not named Michi Johnson really had a good game. I guess B.J. Mack had 16 points, 5 of 13. We'll break it all down uh, with Chandler Mack coming up. Okay, last week – Shane Beamer expected to make two coaching moves and really three with one person shifting roles at South Carolina. And that is James Coley was hired last week. He is a coaching veteran. He is an SEC veteran. He's a native of Miami. He brings strong recruiting chops and an SEC pedigree. He coached with Nick Saban at LSU and with the Miami Dolphins. He coached at Florida State, uh, at Miami. Then he was on Kirby Staff's initial, uh, Kirby Smart's initial staff at Georgia, along with Shane Beamer. Uh, he coached wide receivers there for two years. Went to Texas A&M with Jimbo Fisher, another guy from the Nick Saban coaching tree. He coached wide receivers and then uh, was the co-OC and the tight ends coach. He will coach wide receivers at South Carolina. He is an ace recruiter. Um, Justin Stepp will shift and coach the tight ends with Jody Wright getting the head coaching job at Murray State. Uh, South Carolina also filling their running backs position. It looked like last Wednesday, was it? No, I'm sorry, Friday, uh, I was on with Mike Yuva on our Free For All Friday show. Looked like South Carolina was going to hire Coastal Carolina running backs coach, Newland Isaac. He chose to stay at Coastal at the 11th hour. And um, it was pretty much between him and Jimmy Smith. Neither one of them wound up, ending up getting the offer. It was Marquel Blackwell, who was also at Texas A&M last year. He's considered one of the rising stars in the industry. He played uh, at Lakewood and Dixie Hollins High School in Pinellas County, which is in the St. Pete area. He Went to USF. He was a quarterback. He played um, a little bit in the NFL. 
and then began uh, a career in a uh, uh, little bit in Canadian football and then in arena football got into coaching he's been at Western Kentucky Florida Toledo spent several years uh, with Dana Holgerson one year their last year at West Virginia three years at Houston then was with Lane Kiffin at Ole Miss, where he recruited and coached Quinshaw Judkins, and uh, then went to Texas A&M, climbing the coaching tree. And, of course, it went off the rails for five loss Jimbo. And uh, when Shane Beamer went to College Station to interview James Coley, along with Dowell Loggins. They also interviewed several other coaches, and Markwell Blackwell was one, and he is considered a rising star in the industry. He's still being paid by Texas A&M, and so there's uh, contractual language that has to be worked out with the mitigation and all of that before a contract can be finalized, but it looks like uh, that is the only holdup at this point. And so that hire should be official later this week. In the transfer portal, Gamecocks bring their total number of additions to 18 by bringing in three uh, recent additions, one, Old friend Gilbert Edmond returns to South Carolina. Uh, proving the grass is not always greener on the other side, even though the money may be. Edmond, I think, will be a key addition to this program. We'll jump into that with Chandler when we talk uh, a little Gamecock football. Gamecocks also add former Auburn and then three-year starter at Florida Atlantic Offensive guard, Kamar Ball, 6'2", 300. He is a three-year starter at Florida Atlantic. And then Gamecocks add former Oregon and Auburn quarterback, Robbie Ashford, 6'3", 220, an athlete, a 50% passer, a really good runner, uh, not the greatest of passers. Did have a pretty good year in 2022 for Auburn. Uh, then Hugh Freeze came in and uh, kind of switched it up. He has two years of eligibility remaining. And so without further ado, let's bring in my guy, <laughs> the Mike Attack. What's that, Chief? <laughs> Happy New Year, brother. How Happy New Year to you too, bro. Yeah, yeah. You doing all right? I am uh, doing better than uh, I deserve. I'm That's struggling. Great. I got an upper respiratory infection, oh, but uh, we're going to uh, get through it. We tough and through. All uh, right. See, are you in the Rick Henry look-alike business with uh, the thin mustache going the there? Mustache. Yeah, I know. You're yeah, looking like look. my man Rick Henry from Mackby. South know, yeah, from Matthew. Shout out to Matthew. Yeah, no, nah, no, nah, no. Nah. The lady likes it. So, yeah. Oh, okay. As, you know, do it for her. Yeah. Hey, yeah. I'm really mad at you. Yeah. Don't treat me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. So, here's the burning question everybody wants to know. What did you think of the most recent season of Fargo, which had the season finale last night? Oh, man. God's sake, Keith. I'm going to be honest. I was watching it because I was at the CLA. <laughs> At that game, uh, and that was it, was it was a little, it was a tough one. It was a long one, man. Oh my goodness, yeah. Nine o'clock tip off, and yeah, the game didn't end until eleven forty-five. I guess uh, what was it? Sixty-four free throws combined between both teams. That that's how you can get to that. So I gotta say, yeah, I did not watch it. Yeah, it was uh, basically a rock throwing contest by the Gamecocks. All right. Mean, Gamecocks not named Michi Johnson. Yeah. From three point range. 
were two of 19. Sound about right. Yeah. Yeah. Bro, I think I can make two for 19 with my eyes closed. Honestly, Keith, I, I could too. Yeah, <laughs> probably. I mean, that was it was rough, man, from start to finish, from first half on to the second half. It was just they could not hit water. They fell out of the boat last night. And the fact they still only lost by five points. I mean, you know, that should tell you something about Georgia. Uh, but yeah, it was a, uh, it, it was, it was a tough one. It, it was definitely a tough one for sure. So on Saturday, Gamecocks didn't play well. Playing a bad team on the road, you give a bad team enough rope, eventually they'll hang themselves if you make just enough plays, right? Like Josh Gray hits two critical free throws against Missouri. Okay, yeah. cuts it from three to one. They get a bucket. Talon Cooper hits a three. They take it to overtime, and Missouri chokes off two front ends of one and ones, and the Gamecocks make just enough plays yeah. uh, to, to win that game, right? Like uh, our guy Jacoby Wright hits oh. a patented baseline fadeaway, same one he hit against Virginia Tech. Yeah. And uh, Missouri can't get a good shot. And so you picked up an SEC road win, which was critical coming off of, you know, Alabama. thrashing at Alabama, right? Yeah. You just didn't show up in the second half. Exactly. And, you know, it was great to get a BJ Mack sighting because he had been MIA in the first two SEC games. You were lucky. Uh, to get Mississippi State at home with Tolu Smith, that being just his second game back. Yeah. Um, he had a favorable matchup uh, against Missouri. In the second half, Georgia kind of downsized. They went away from Sheway, the big seven-footer from the Cameroon, who that dude was just too big. He too was big. Like, you too small. Yeah. You yeah. too little. Yeah. Um, and Mike hit some shots. I thought he was really good inside. Yeah. He but did. he just cannot. I mean, I, it's a curse. He made his first three pointer from the corner and then, you know, yeah. 0 for 5 after yeah. that. And really not even close on yeah. most of them. Yeah. Um, but still, Gamecocks have the lead at the half. Yep. Okay, just they were only down one at Alabama, only down one against Missouri. They have the lead against Georgia. They come out and they go up 48-39 yeah. with 14.05 to go, and you think, here we go. Mm -hmm. And from there – until like five and a half minutes, they Georgia goes on a sixteen to two run. Yeah, and those two were one made free throw, one missed, one made, one missed. No field goals. Nope, nope. And the Gamecocks during that that stretch from fourteen oh five to five thirty four went two for eleven from the. Not from the field, from the free throw, free throw. line. Yes. And yeah. look, I mean, just your thoughts. I mean, we could talk about the officiating, but when you miss 15 free throws, when you miss point blank layups, and then you miss 23, you cannot bring, you cannot blame the officiating as bad as it was, which, you know, Clearly, there were some rotten calls for the yes. Gamecocks last night. It, it, yeah, they, they, they certainly were were very key. But, yeah, like you mentioned, you missed 23 pointers. You missed six for 26 from three. That's not going to get it done. Literally, you hit two of those three pointers, you win that game. 74-69 game. Then my thing was, and this is like my biggest takeaway from the game, that I was like telling everybody afterwards, it was just, dude, 15 missed free throws. I think Josh Gray missed like six straight. In, in, in the span of, like, two minutes, right? That just can't happen, ultimately. I mean, again, you hit 
six of those free throws, which still isn't necessarily the greatest percentage. I'll be like 23 for 32, I think. Not that great, but you win the game once again. You got to you gotta hit those free throws, honestly. And like you said, all the missed layups, all the missed – Miss three pointers. I mean, ultimately, that's that's why you lost the game. Yeah, the officiating could have been a heck of a lot better than what it was, but you had your chances. Georgia, literally, I was like, literally sitting there on the on the on the like on the side, Keith, and I was like, dude, they're giving the Gamecocks chance after chance. Somebody do something, right? Somebody make a free throw. Somebody make a three pointer, and it just seemed like again, like you said, if it wasn't Michi Johnson, if it wasn't BJ Mack in the first half. In the first two minutes of the first half, it seemed like nobody could hit a three-pointer. And, again, that's 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 why you lose that game. Um, it's tough for them because it would have really been nice to have gone into Saturday's game with, with a, you know, a three-and-two SEC record. But, you know, now, obviously, yeah, you're not that. But, um, but yeah, man, it's – yeah, it, it was yeah, definitely tough. been three-and-one going into Saturday's game. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I was thinking about – my bad. I was thinking about Clemson. And they lost against George Tech. That had me uh, a little, little, little confused. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's it. You would have been three and one going into that game. Now you're two and two, which still isn't awful, not bad. But man, it's just it, it would have been a lot different, like you said, going in there three and one instead of two and two. Yeah, I mean, here's the thing: when Michi Johnson goes on a heater, he he doesn't cool off until he's back in the locker room after the game. Exactly. Like, I, look, I get it. B.J. Mack is a very confident dude. Yeah. I think probably too confident when he's standing out there. Yeah. <laughs> dude, use that 260-pound wide body to yeah. set a ball screen uh -huh. for Michi and roll and get your big ass down on the block and yeah. go to work because yeah. – you did not have Chi Wei in the second half. Exactly. He should have dominated down there because he does have a nice low post game. But I yes. mean, is it me or is he just not tough enough? Does he just like to stay out there and jack up too many threes? To me, it's too many threes. I mean, yeah, a lot. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure, Keith. And then, like, I mean, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's like the trend that we're seeing with with a lot of guys now, where even in the in the pros, it's like I, I'm a Lakers fan. I'll see Anthony Davis chucking up threes all the time. Like, dude, if you don't get in the freaking paint and dot like and and, and and dominate, do what God put you on this planet to do, please, man. Right. So I, I think that's just the trend with a lot of big men now. They're like, okay, well, I need to stretch stretch the floor, all that, which works totally, totally fine. But like you mentioned, when Big 54 is out the game in the second half, hey, this is the time, all right? And when, hey, Michi, yeah, he's doing his thing, but no one else is really helping him out like that. Okay, BJ, yeah, let's, let's, we're, we're going to give you the ball inside and let you do your thing. Because like you said, he has a really good low post game. I think it's pretty good in the mid range too. And sometimes they don't utilize that enough either, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely uh, he, he can lay off the threes just a little bit, especially if they're not falling. Like, you take your first three and you, you miss two of the three, okay, yeah, that, that 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 should tell you, okay, maybe I shouldn't shoot more than five threes this game. Let's try to take it inside, especially, like you said, in the second half when you have the advantage. I really thought a key injury in the second half was Miles Studi. He didn't have a great first half, but he comes out – Hits a three, which really ignited him a little bit. Yeah. Right when South Carolina's building that lead, and then, you know, they get the hold and hook and pull his shoulder out. He's having the MRI today. He could not return. Yeah. You know, Zach Davis uh, evidently was not properly hydrated. He was cramping up. Yeah. And you can't have that. Yeah, but it was not the best Zach Davis game. He had a really bad foul on Abdur Rahim when the guy's running away from the basket and yeah. he's holding him. Yeah. Uh, they're already in a bonus, and that put him in double bonus. Yeah. And I mean, it, you know, it just was not 
working and Jacoby Wright, he just continues to struggle from outside. I mean, his three corners looked as painful as Josh Gray's free throws because after the first one, Josh Gray did not believe he was going to make a single shot. Yeah. You could tell. Yeah. He was yeah. just throwing it up, hoping yeah. for something to go in. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's like you're home. You're home. You're in your gym. You're, you're yes. in the place that you're here. You're practice at. You're in the lab at all the time. Like, hey, man, we – like. Like I'm like talking from from the fans' perspective, it's like, hey, bro, we got you. We're gonna be quiet and all of that. Just just focus, lock in, and, and hit. But that's it. I mean, I think Shaq said it. Shaq said it numerous times. He's like, look, I I can hit fifty, a hundred in a row in practice. But it's like when you're out there and the lights are on, it, it is a different thing. But yeah, I think that the, the one thing that Coach Paris has got to do until Saturday, okay, all y'all fifty free throws after practice. Every every single guy on the team after a performance like that last night, where like I said, literally you hit six of those free throws, you win the game, and and that 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 it is literally that simple. I think yeah, you got to have those guys in the lab. Uh, but yeah, you mentioned Jacoby. Maybe he. I, I personally think he maybe he's a guy that okay, you might want to leave the three alone for a little bit, get in the lab a little bit, work on that because his mid range game. You mentioned that fadeaway. He's been killing it with that. He's, I think he can drive to the rack really well as well. Maybe you just stick to that and only take a three if you're, like, wide open and you have a lot of room. And even then, like I said, get in the lab first before you try that. Yeah, I mean, sometimes, and I thought this was the case in the first half, I thought Georgia's strategy was to allow B.J. Mack to shoot open threes. A little like that, right? Players not named Jacoby or uh, not named Michi Michi. Johnson to shoot open threes. Yeah. Because I don't think they – I thought they felt like that was a good strategy. Then we saw in the beginning of the second half, they brought their big man way out to hedge, and you saw them throw it over the top into Colin Murray Boyles because of the way – Georgia was playing defense. Exactly. And they got some buckets off that. Then Georgia adjusted again. And, you know, Josh Gray's hands are not the best. But, yeah, man, I mean, you miss two layups when you're not being hit, and then you make the one when you are being hit. But you right. can't make another one. I mean, that was another thing. There were a lot of those bunnies that were missed that were very makeable, even though you were getting fouled because it wasn't like you were really getting hammered. Yes, there was contact, but it normally was not on the shooting arm. I thought that was particularly true for Colin Murray Boyles, who just at times couldn't finish through contact. Yeah, and I think the thing with Colin is, you know, we 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 got to, you know, obviously remember he's a freshman. He's this was his first home start. He's obviously from the area, so I think I'm not gonna say butterflies, but obviously you could tell that he was a little he was a little amped up, right? But he played well outside of the 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 the, the mishaps on offense. Uh, he had four blocks, led the team in that regard in that category. So I mean, I and I do like him in the starting lineup. I love the fact that Coach Paris told us after the game yesterday that Stephen Clark went to him and was like, hey, Colin needs to start over me too. That just tells you it's the type of guy that, uh, that that Stephen is for doing that and realizing, hey, this guy, this younger guy, could give us a bit of a spark more than I can at this stage of the game. But, uh, but yeah, I think that's it with Colin. Just got to give him a little bit more time. He's a freshman, like I said, amped up. And, you know, obviously the mono that he had early in the season is also – not having an effect on him, but it's just a thing of, okay, he's got to get acclimated. He he missed a, a lot of time early in the season. And now, okay, he's, you know, maybe a little bit behind the eight ball a little bit because of that. And even still, like I said, he's playing well and making plays. It's just a matter of giving him some time to, to develop. No doubt about it. So the next Three games are going to be critical for South Carolina. They are at Arkansas, who has been struggling mightily. It's the best environment in the SEC. 
Uh, Bud Walton Arena is, I think, probably the biggest home court advantage because of the design of the arena because, I mean, let's face it, there's a lot of hillbillies out there and they love their basketball, right? Well, the Arkansas mean, Razorbacks, man. <laughs> I mean, you know, 40 minutes of hell, Nolan Richardson. I mean, that was back in the day. Yeah. Um, and they really packed it. And, you know, they are – struggling but they got they got the players they got talent yes but it is another opportunity for south carolina to go and get back on track and steal another sec road game because you're not going to win all your home games i mean no. you, you kicked that one away last night like you said if you go 23 for 32 which is below your season average yeah you win the game, or if you just go eight for 26, which would have been about 30%. From three, yeah. From three, you win the game. Yeah. Um, they got to make – look, you can talk about defense. I thought the defense was pretty good. I, I thought the Gamecocks got beat on the boards. They did which uh, there were a lot of 50-50 balls. I thought Georgia was much more athletic, it appeared. On TV, they made it really difficult, particularly early on for South Carolina, and then in that stretch in the second half to get good looks because they were just quicker, longer, and, you know, Mike White's a really good coach. Yes, yeah. Um. And so you gotta you gotta control the boards, but you I mean I don't care how good a defense you play, it goes to the team that scores the most points. Okay? That's what it boils down to. Every basketball coach will tell you defense wins championships. Well, it does, but you gotta score. You gotta score. Yeah. yeah. Two years ago, South Carolina women's basketball, it was an anomaly. Like, they were the worst national champion offensively in, like, 30 years. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Perfect segue as we transition over to Gamecock women's basketball. Yeah. Uh, I know you were – at Colonial Life Arena on Monday night when they played Kentucky. Yeah. By the way, my guy, J.C. Sherbert, shout out, bro, if you need a loan. He took Kentucky in 44 and a half. They did not cover. They did not. <laughs> they did not. He lost that. 98 to 32, and they could have broke the scoreboard if they wanted to, right? Yeah. Um, had to call off the dogs. Uh huh. Um, but Ashlyn Swatkins, Swatkins, Duncans, all of that. Yes, yes. Duncans, <laughs> well, Duncans Donuts. <laughs> she gets the pilfer, the plunder, the thunder. I mean, she threw it down. Threw it down. It close. Like you go back and look. On the uh, Gamecock Women Basketball Twitter account, they have four still frame photos. Yeah. Like, look, let's just be honest. BJ Mack and the BBV and others on that men's team wish they had Ashlyn Watson's vertical. I, yeah. I mean, he's up there. I wish I had that vertical. I'd be, me too, when man. I was, yeah. back in the day when I was playing. Yeah, no, nah, me too. Gee, yeah, man. Like, gosh. Yeah, and it was it was so crazy. Gee, and the great thing was, was like, we were, we were like, I was shooting it, and you could tell when she was gathering, she was about to do it. And if you, if you watch them warm up, that's the, that's the goal that, like, that's the rim that they warm up on and all of that. And she'll usually end the warm ups with a dunk, literally from that angle. Oh, like from the left, the, on the left side, she'll come and then she'll dunk like that. So we've seen her do it. Numerous times, you, you clearly tell that she was comfortable with doing it, and yeah, it was like we saw her steal it. Everybody got up, and I'm like, "Yo, I think she's she's gonna dunk it," and then she did, and it was from that point on. 
I don't know if you 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 like Pete Fitz either, Keith. I think it was 15 to 11 when she dunked. That made it 17 to 11. So from that point on, the Gamecocks outscored Kentucky 81 to what would it be 25. After yeah. that, that literally changed the entire trajectory and 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 course of the game. And I mean, it's. It, it 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 was wild, man. I mean, the, the like the. Well, I mean, we'll we'll dive into like how loaded they are in a bit, but literally to beat uh, uh, Kentucky's not what they used to be when they had Ryan Howard and all of that. They're they're not that. They're eight and ten right now, and like I said, they're not what they used to be. They're probably not gonna make the tournament. Not probably. They're they're not gonna make the tournament this year, but still, they're in the SEC to beat them by sixty two points. It's mind boggling. It's and, crazy and, and cruised. Cruz. Let's face it. Not only was it eighty-one to twenty-five after that, it was thirty-one to ten to end the first half. Exactly. Thirty-one to ten, and then thirty-three to eleven in the third quarter, and then against the reserves in the fourth quarter, they only scored four points. Exactly. I mean they. That's kind of like Vanderbilt in football. They knew they would already taken their, yeah. you know, beat down. They were ready to, you know, get a shower and get on the bus back to the airport and fly home. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Like, let's go back to Lexington, Kentucky at this point in time. Because, yeah, this was, yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about just how different this team is for our audience. South Carolina is the number one team in the country. We all know that. They've gone Absolutely. back to the unanimous number one now that UCLA lost. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, but that's not what I'm getting at. They are number one in the nation in three-point field goal percentage. Yeah. Okay, they are 44%. They only – they average 7.3 makes a game. So they're not shooting, that you know, 30 and making yeah. 14. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tahina Pow Pow, the number one three point shooter in the country. Pow Pow. Yeah, Pow Pow. 57%. How's that even possible, man? Like, 57%. Yeah, yes. From downtown, 42 of 70. Four, fifty-seven percent. I mean, there. That's a quote, Dan Patrick. Dare I say, in Fuego? Yeah, for real. That's before your time, bro. I know. Yeah, seen, yeah, yeah. I know you've seen, 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 seen the, the, the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see the clips. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They got from YouTube. <laughs> that's right, YouTube. Yeah. Um, Threezy Hall. That's hashtag Threezy Hall. That's the thing. Yeah. David, I haven't even had to correct her dad, Brian. It's Threezy, T H R E E Z Y. Exactly. Threezy Hall. Threezy. Yeah. Capital T, capital H. Uh huh. Threezy Hall. 48%. And. In the most recent road game at Missouri, she she showed her whole bag. Like oh, she man. went into the deep, all the way down into the bag, off the bounce from downtown in the mid range, everything. Yeah. But here's the thing: there are four players and three starters that all shoot at least 41% from distance in my lady of full Wiley. Yeah. Add it to the real, right? That's what my man Ryan Ruka says. Yeah. He is not one of them. It's not. Yeah. Okay, because on the road, she just throws up some very bad-looking threes, and then when she's at home, she just bottoms them out. Bottoms them. Yeah. Right? That's that's a freshman, you know. That's yeah. That 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 that's yeah. Yeah, she's got to learn to 
take well we, we know she can take the show on the road i mean we saw that in paris in the very first game of the season but yeah she's got to learn how to take the three-point game to the road which she will she she definitely will all right so tessa johnson man silky smooth mm -hmm. 42 percent she's come on of late she has yeah um raven Johnson, 41%. Yeah. And so here you've got your bigs, right? Like you got so many players shooting over 50%. Cardoso, 60%. Hell, she should be shooting 70%, quite yeah. frankly. Yeah. <laughs> um, but this team. I think is the most difficult team to guard because if you try to take away the three and run them off the line, they're going to go by you. Mm -hmm. If you sag off, they're going to bang it in on you. And if you get up on them enough, you're just creating enough space for Cardoso, Watkins. Chloe. Kids has been really good from the high post. Yes. I think, you know, these next two games will be really huge tests for her on the road, more against more physical opponents. She's kind of struggled uh, yeah. to finish inside. But not Swatkins. Not at all. Not Sanaya Fagan. And so you got depth at every position. Every. The kryptonite, same thing that got the men. It's been a more seasonal problem for the Gamecocks has been free throw shooting. Yeah. You know, but if they get through these next two games, I think it's over. Yeah. We'll yeah. be seeing angry Kim Mulkey face because she will not be winning the SEC this nah. year. No, nah, no, nah, nah, not the regular season. Now, I said this last year, Keith, and I don't want to wish this on them, but I thought last year what hurt them a lot was the fact that they didn't lose at least one time. I think you went into the in the big dance undefeated, and you had all the pressure. You had the winning streak going, all of that, all that pressure. And while they were battle-tested, all of that, I think that that got them a little bit. So I do want them to at least – lose one <laughs> over the next like couple of games all right even you know we hope that's not to lsu for obvious reasons but i do want i think that would be good for them just so they know okay this is what a loss feels like we don't ever want to experience this again and now we can really go out here and, and win another national championship because i think that that's what helped the loss to kentucky in 2022 in the sec tournament championship game i think that's really what helped that team go over the top because they were like, look, we don't ever want to experience this pain again. Right. So I do low key. It would be great. They went undefeated and all that. I'll be a one heck of a story to tell, but just off the sake of, okay, you know what a loss feels like. You don't have to, you can go into a game with less pressure now because you don't have to worry about to keeping the winning streak going. I do want to see that with this team. I think that would be beneficial for them, but having said all of that, like you said, if they win these next two, and depending on how they win them, if they win them by double digits, which I think they're fully capable of doing, yeah, it's it's scary for a lot of people. And you mentioned Raven Johnson, you know, shooting forty percent from three. Yeah, no one's waving her off anymore, right? That, that's not happening anymore. You, yeah, she's she got in the lab, three Z Hall. She got in the lab, and. The, the young the youngins with Malaysia Tessa they've come in and they've been that spark plug off the bench that Raven and Camilla were last year for the squad they they've come in and they've done that Sanaya's been rising has been better and better and yeah I mean as we you, you said Ashlyn I mean the fact that she was perfectly cool with yeah Chloe can start I'll come off the bench and be you know be a part of that spark plug and she's totally totally embraced it I think she's She's only second on the team at blocks because Camilla is, you know, six, seven, six, nine. And, you know, obviously she's first. But the fact that she's still second behind Camilla, 
it, it's mind boggling, man. And then just the, the way she's able to get steals and, 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 and all of that and, and still be able to create her own shot on offense. I mean, yeah, they're, I mean, they're just, they're so loaded and you kind of said it, they really have no weakness outside of the free throw shooting. And even with not the greatest free throw shooting, they're still <laughs> beating teams by 39 points on average. Right. I mean, even with that. So yeah, it, it, it's wild. I mean, I, I'm not ready to necessarily say that they're better than the team than last year's team and the team that won the national championship in 2022. But I think when you see the firepower that this team has, the teams from from last year and, and two years ago, they're not being a team 98 to 36. They may be a team 70 to 36, but the scoring, the way that this team is just able to score in so many different ways and not really have a weakness there. That's the difference for me. That's the thing that makes me say, I, I don't know. I don't know because they just have so much firepower. And the firepower isn't like one of those, like they live by the three, die by the three type things. No, it's like if they live by three, yeah, they're going to beat you by 60 or whatever. But even if their three's not balling, they're still probably going to beat you by like 30 and still probably put up like 80 points. And, and I think, yeah, that's the difference. I mean, no doubt. So I I believe this team is deeper and more talented. Yeah. I'm not saying they're better because you don't have a national player of the year, Aaliyah Boston. Yes. I mean, at this point, I think you have to compartmentalize because at this point now, you don't really want to lose. If you lose in the conference tournament, I mean, anytime there's a trophy involved, you do not want to lose as a coach. As a coach, I mean, yeah. You sure. just do not. As yeah. a player, you don't. Yeah. I felt like that team could handle it. I just don't think the refs could handle it because, let's be honest, Caitlin Clark getting away with murder and, and their bigs uh, assaulting – Aaliyah Boston, right. and then calling touch fouls on her. Yeah. And completely taking one national player of the year off the floor while leaving one national player of the year on the floor who pushes off on every play. Yeah. And then uh, everybody's outraged when on Sunday they finally called someone. Yeah. Why the damn things on Friday? On Friday. Night, yeah. have been. South Dawn Staley would have been cutting down the nets because, I mean, bro, they they beat down LSU last year. They had no shot no. Uh, against South Carolina. No, and no. I don't know that they do on next Thursday, but for me, I have not seen the improvement in Cardoso that I'd hoped – to see right. your thoughts on that on that i i, I would say you know because that was the thing i was worry oh i was kind of worried about keith with with with, with camilla because you got to look at okay who is she following right and who was that person following basically like Aaliyah was essentially following Asia wilson and in my opinion lived up to it and they were like i mean you want to talk about the greatest players in ain't got women's basketball history i mean that's 1A, 1B, and then whoever, you know, pick your poison with it, right, in, in my opinion. Because you can say, okay, Aja may have been more dynamic o offensively. Okay, well, Leah was a better defender than Aja. Aja ultimately developed into a great defender, is now defense player of the year two times over and all of that. But when she was at Carolina, you know, it, it, it took she, she was focused on offense because she didn't have to be as focused on defense, right? But so that's what she's following. She's following the, the, the two – Goats, two of two of the players who are on the Mount Rushmore, right? And she already was coming in, not as skilled as them, and, and still trying to develop her game and all of that. And while, yeah, I think she has certainly grew in a lot of areas. Because I was watching like the game Monday night, I realized, wow, she is a really great passer. Like she can really pass out of a double team very well, pass like onto a fast break really well. She can do all of that, um, but. Yeah, her post game may not be as advanced as we may have hoped it to be. But again, you got to look at, well, she really asked, is she being asked to do 
all of that, like Aaliyah was asked to do all of it. Not really, because she has so many other people on the team, so many other weapons on the team. So she's not, we, we, you know, I feel like we can't really say, okay, she hasn't developed a real post game like that because we haven't really seen her be asked to, to do that. Like she's asked to grab the rebound, put it back, and then every now and then get it if you have like a disadvantage and lay it up. And yeah, sometimes she misses it, but I have noticed she gets that rebound and where last year she may have missed the putback. Now she's hitting a lot of those putbacks. Like if she misses the first shot and has to like get the second chance point, she's hitting that a lot more frequently this year. So I have seen, like I said, in those areas I've seen improvement, but I think it's like, we can't really say as far as her post game, if she's really improved like that, because we just haven't, they haven't had to ask her to do it because Again, there's so many other weapons at her disposal, if you will, that she doesn't have to. Now, that's going to be a thing to when she makes a transition to the WNBA. She's going to have to develop that, right? Because this is going to be a lot different. But as of right now, I mean, yeah, she, you know, she can get by doing what she's doing, and she's doing it well. She's doing it very efficiently. I mean, I still think though this team plays inside out. Like I said, they don't yeah. accept a ton of threes, like around 15 per game on yeah. that because they're making 7.3. So maybe at 14, no, it's yeah, it's probably about 15, 15, 15. per yeah. game. They're making 7.3 per game. They play inside out. Like yeah. I think they would go into her more – if she was finishing more shots because she's in there, they're wanting to throw it up to her. Now, sometimes they don't always throw it up like they oh. should throw it up to yeah. her. I guess the regression I've seen is her bringing the ball down. Like last year, I thought she kept it up over her head more. Yeah. Uh, that may be just a coaching dynamic shift from Fred Jamil to Lisa Boyer. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'll, I'll ask you this kind of as a follow-up. Do you think she's like holding it down more because she may be asked to do that at the next level? And it's like, you're trying to prepare for that or you, yeah, you think it's just a coaching. No, I think, look, I coach Kevin Garnett when he was 16 years old. Uh, I got to throw passes to Tim Duncan in the summer before his freshman year at Wake Forest. Mm. When those guys caught it, I never saw them bring it below here. You kept it okay. Always, always right, ne never down here. Okay. So if you're six seven, why are you going to bring it down to where a six-foot player can – or a five-nine player can get their hands on it? Yeah. When they catch it up there, you want them to be strong. But Camilla mostly can just feel the defense and turn away or turn in and score. Yeah, because you saw it in everybody pretty much. Yeah. yeah, and especially with her wingspan, yeah. And it helps you draw more fouls instead of having the ball stripped and getting more jump balls because it, there are a lot of strips – and a lot of jump balls. So, yeah, I know I only got you for a few more minutes. So, just your reaction to the college football coaching shift. Nick Saban retires. Right. I caught everybody off guard, even him, right? Yeah. Like he's interviewing coaches. He's on an SEC conference call, and then he's like, well, I got a team meeting in five minutes. <laughs> I think I'm out of here. I think I'm done. I'm yeah. 72. I'm the GOAT. I'm going to the beach with Miss Terry. I'm probably going to be on college game day for like $16 million a year, right? Hey, I mean, shoot, what, Tom Brady got? Yeah, I mean, shoot, Tom Brady got, what, $37 million a year from uh, Fox Sports? I mean, ah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Yeah, I don't blame him. I, I do not blame him. But, yeah, yeah, to answer, yeah, I was shocked. I mean, I was kind of shocked, but kind of not. And, and and here's why. Because 
if you think about it, he's been doing a lot of things this year that he hasn't really done. We've seen him more. Like he did the Pat McAfee show every what every Thursday, pretty much this season. And when have I we can't ever believe he went on that clown show? <laughs> I mean, come on. Yeah. A but, grown man wearing a tank top. I mean, yeah. come on. Look at you. Look at me. I mean, I don't know. I got mine from BP Skinner Clothiers, uh, which is the title sponsor of the show, located in the heart of the business. So shout out to my man, Brett Skinner at yeah. BP Skinner Clothiers, one yeah. of the beer clothiers in America. Yeah. You making all that dough and you wearing a tank top every day? Every day. You're not that rip, bro. You're not the rock. Okay. Yeah, exactly. I mean, come on. Hey, yeah, if the rock come now, you're like, I mean, maybe we should have Dabo on the show every week because then there'd be, you know, like Ronald McDonald and Bozo the Clown on, on the same show. Oh, geez, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but nah, man, I, yeah, so like, like you said, the fact that he was, that he's doing that, right? And then I feel like just in regular interviews, like he's been more open and more honest, right? And the, the the changing of the landscape of college football, right? Introduction, you know, NIL, transfer portal, all of that just really, really taking over the game. I think Nick looked at it and was like, you know what? I'm good. I got the most out of this team because, I mean, I talked to a lot of people. I got a lot of friends who covered, like, Alabama and all of that. And they told me, dude, this team is not, it's not that good. And they're, you know, yeah, they beat Georgia, but – it's going to be tough for them in the playoff. And I was like, I mean, dude, it's Alabama. Like, nah, they, they'll figure it out. Yeah, they're playing Michigan. But, yeah, they'll they'll beat Michigan. No, I was shocked. Nah, I mean, Michigan, I mean, they they were legit, legit. And, and yeah, they, they I mean, they shut it down. Shut it down for real. And I think he, he said, look, I got the most out of this team. And, like I said, the landscape of college football is changing a lot. I'm 72. And I can get this big deal from college game day and ESPN. I'm just going to go home. And, yeah, so in that sense. But still, like I said, the shock came just off of, oh, my gosh, he's actually doing it. This is wild, right? And then you look at what's going on in the NFL with, you know, his good friend Bill Belichick, you know, and the Patriots parting ways. It's like, whoa, we're really in different times now. Like, we're getting old, Keith. This is <laughs> like – this is uh this is a new new age, man, for real. Um, but uh, but shout out to, to Coach Fade. I mean, nothing left to prove, nothing else to prove. Like you've your legacy's already made, and and yeah, go ahead and and and, and live your life yeah, and enjoy. I mean, I'm sure he's enjoyed life, but now it's like you can really, really enjoy life because you're not worried about the day to day grind of being the head coach at Alabama. I don't really think he has enjoyed life because I've had a unique insight into him. And, I mean, it's 20 hours a day, seven days a week. Yeah. 365. Right? Mm -hmm. Now with the, you know, they have limited transfer portal, but with summer camps, with the recruiting period. I mean, so for instance, when he won his first national championship at LSU, they were in the Superdome. Yeah. I'm pretty sure it was in New Orleans. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. So they don't get out of the locker room to like 1.30 a.m. Saban meets with the coaches and says, all right, man, y'all go out and enjoy it. We got a recruiting meeting at 6 a.m. After winning the national championship. After winning the national championship. <laughs> I mean, Next level, that's, why, that's why his staff is paid so much and why there's so much turnover. Like, I know my friend Brad Lawing, like Nick Saban left Michigan State. He went to LSU. He interviewed for the job. He got the job. He called the office. All the coaches were in there. He said, hey, I'm sending the plane. Tell all those guys, all the guys that want to come to LSU to be at the airport. They all sitting around the office. They're like, man, you going? Yeah. Like, man, I just don't think I can do it. How about you going? 
Nobody left. Bobby Williams got that job. He was on staff. He kept everybody. Yeah, Nobody yeah. went. When he went to Alabama, he had to have the highest paid coaching staff in the country because of the demand. So I'm hoping he will enjoy life, him and Miss Terry. And, you know, I do know there's a different side to him than what we see, but some people work to live. Some people live to work. Yeah. And so I think that's it for him. Yeah. So obviously Belichick, Pete Carroll, Nick Saban, all gone. It just goes to show it is becoming a younger man's game. Kalen DeBoer to Alabama. Yeah. Jeff Fish from Arizona to Washington. Yeah. San Jose State coach goes to Arizona. Mm -hmm. All those players, 30 days in the transfer portal. Yeah. It's wild, man. There's yeah. a coaching change. Well, the portal's closed. Well, not for them. 30 days. 30 days, yeah. And so, hey, what happens when Jim Harbaugh is the next coach of the Chargers or yeah. the Falcons or whoever, the Red, well, the Command. Right. Commanders, yeah. Excuse me, <laughs> not the Redskins. Yeah, it's tough, man. I, I always say, I just say Washington because Washington. I know, yeah. I'm gonna say, yeah, I'm gonna say. I mean, they Washington. haven't been relevant, bro, since John Riggins played, and they were the Redskins. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rigo. Yeah. So, anyway, I mean, then what if? LSU or uh, Michigan desires not to hire Sharon Moore, and they yeah. bring in Brian Kelly. Then yeah. LSU does. Then, then that's thirty days. Then is Lane Kiffin getting that job? Right. Yeah. Probably. Or yeah. maybe the dude at Florida State. Then that's going to be thirty days. I yeah. mean, is it ever going in? Never going in. Never going in. That's that's yeah. It's, and that's why I think Nick was like, yeah, I got it. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you have to spend all the time re-recruiting your own players every year because now players can transfer every year. Every it's year. Madness. I think there's going to be a mass exodus to the NFL unless something changes. something changes. And, and like, what's your opinion on this? If if I, because I, I've been thinking about this, it's like okay, the thing that I, I'm I'm not really in love with is that a guy can literally be at school for like basically four months, their freshman year, and then they're like, you know what, I'm gonna enter the portal. I feel like there there needs to be maybe a mandate, like okay, you got to be this age to transfer to, to enter the portal. I mean, and I know guys, you know, guys been transferring after their freshman year for years, even before NIL and all of that, but it's just. I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Like, literally, a guy can literally be at a school for four or five months, and then they decide, okay, yeah, let me hop in the portal. Let me go somewhere else. It's like, well, you're committed to this school and, and this program, right? And now, all of a sudden, you're like, okay, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna go. Unless, like, it's a unique circumstance. Like, the coach that recruited you got fired or – or, or, or something like that. But if it's like, okay, pretty much the entire coaching staff is the same. You're just maybe getting more money from this school. Like, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I just, yeah, I, that, 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 that's something that I, I, I'm not the biggest fan of um, about the portal. Yeah, but otherwise, like I said, I'm fine with the guys getting their money and, and all of that. It's just, you're a freshman. And like you, you know, and then okay, let's say you go to this school for your sophomore year, and then that doesn't work out, right? And then you get in the portal again, right? It's just, it, it's crazy, man. It's crazy that this is what you know college football has come to. So I think it's kind of like a lot of dudes I know that went to the Citadel like that first year at Tail. Yeah, but they just quit calling home because they're gonna tough it out. Like yeah. I think I'm for the old system. Like maybe you get a one-time transfer unless yeah. the head coach is fired. 
Yeah. But, you know, okay, if you have signed to go to Clemson and or South Carolina and Dabo Sweeney or Shane Beamer goes to the NFL and gets another job, then you can transfer. Then you can, yeah. Because that's the coach. Your, your, your national letter of intent should be void if you're on the team. You get the 30 days and the portal. Yeah. Other than that, though, multiple time transfers only as a graduate. After one transfer, you have to sit out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think going to 12 team playoff, you will see fewer transfers because at least eight more teams are going to be in the playoff. Exactly. I mean, yeah. I still don't know when is the best time for the portal. I really don't think there's any good time. Uh, and so we'll see. I mean, there's going to have to be a higher body than the NCAA to institute laws that can be investigated and upheld through subpoena power. Yeah. In order for things to change. That's just the bottom line. Exactly. It's going to have to be labor laws or something to regulate at the federal level. Yeah. So, last question before I know you got to get out. Oh, yeah, uh, yeah. Your thoughts on Shane Beamer bringing in James Coley. It looks like Markwell Blackwell will be coming in as the running back coach, or considered yeah. a rising star in the industry. Yeah. That and shifting Justin Step to tight ends. And then, to me, 21 players out, probably only like three or four that. Really, you would have really liked to have kept, but you got rid of a lot of dead weight. <laughs> I think you're bringing in a lot of good players. Some guys have to, have to play, have some question marks. But to me, it is a big net gain uh, of talent, particularly when you consider you're gonna have 30 new guys that are on your campus right now for spring practice, 12 high school guys. 18 scholarship transfer for guys. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I I, I like I really I really enjoyed the moves that they made um during um during the, the portal period and then in, in recruiting the, 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 the freshmen that are coming in. I, I do really like it. I think what we are gonna see from this offense next year is gonna be a lot more run oriented, I feel like. I mean you can just tell off of the fact that you have a 6'4", 245, 440-pound quarterback, Lenore Sellers, who, yeah, he's got a cannon for an arm, but let's be real, he can run the ball very, very well. And then we know, okay, bringing in Rocket Sanders uh, from Arkansas, yeah, he had an injury play here last fall, but before that, man was all SEC player, and he knows Dow Loggins pretty well, too, from their time at Arkansas. So I think you're going to see him be involved a lot in the offense, which is great because let's be real. Yeah. The run game, especially the last, really the last two seasons, but definitely last year, it was not great at all. So that's going to be nice. And in the SEC, you need to be able to run the ball as great as Spencer Rattler was as great as Xavier Leggett were, was last year. What the Achilles heel of the offense was the fact, okay, if you stop 17, you, you, you could kind of figure out the rest of, of the offense. And that was largely because you didn't have much of a run game outside of the few games that Mario Anderson ran the ball well for you, right? Uh, but ultimately, you know, he kind of broke down as the season went on because you know, he had no one else. He had no one else to really spell him like that, especially when Juju went down with an injury. So now you've added depth. Uh, with Rocket Sanders, with Juju coming back, and, and and the other guys that you signed in the portal, you added depth to that room. I would have liked them to make maybe a few more moves with receiver at the receiver spot. I know they got uh, Jared Brown from from Coastal Carolina and Maceo Bennett's coming in as a freshman. I think they're really expecting Nick Harbor to make that that jump as a sophomore. And, and, and again, I think he's fully capable of doing that. But that is going to be really key um, if he's going to if he is able to do that, and and just the potential of this offense if that is able to happen. As far as the coaching changes, I I, I like Montario Hardesty. I liked him as a person, and I thought he was a, a he is a good football coach. 
But I think ultimately just it's a results oriented business and results were the run game deteriorated every year after he started in 2021. Came in, had Kevin Harris, had Marshawn Lloyd. Run game was pretty good in 2021. Then Kevin Harris leaves. Marshawn Lloyd's there. Juju McDowell's there. Christian Bill Smith's there. The run game is kind of middle of the pack in the SEC. You lose Marshawn, and that just – and then you try to put the carry-on joiner at running back. And fortunately, yeah, that just didn't work out. And the answer to that was, okay, bringing in Mario Anderson, who I thought played very well, very well. But – he probably was your should have been your backup, and then you asked him to be your starter, right? Um, and I think that that's just ultimately the reason why. Hey, you had to make you had to make the change, and you know you bring in Blackwell from from Texas A&M, who, like you said, is a rising star in the in in the business, and is someone who's worked with running backs before and have had success working with them. So I think that that's going to be a really really big move as well. So. Like I said, I, I do I did like the moves. I hated that they lost who are probably the guys that for me that I feel like, you know, losing Stone, even though he wasn't the greatest linebacker uh last year, he was still your starting linebacker and he still had moments last year when he was successful losing him to the portal, uh losing Pup Howard to the portal. Again, guys who you thought okay would have probably uh would have been starters for you. You lost them, but I thought okay, you, you, you were able to get guys to maybe replace the voids that they left. So I think that that's good. So like I said, I think overall, I think they had a pretty good offseason going into spring camp. And now it's just a matter of, okay, putting all of that together and, you know, seeing what could happen on the field this year. You still got a tough schedule, right? I mean, that, that, that's, that, that's the SEC schedule, especially that grind in October, right, where I think they're playing off the top of my head, what is it, like, Oklahoma, Ole Miss, Alabama, all like in like a three, four week that and LSU, I think that's going to be tough, right? You hope to go like two and two in that stretch, but uh, maybe Alabama all of a sudden we're not looking at that game as bad as we did, you know, when they had Nick Saban there now, but, uh, but overall, yeah, I like the moves they made. Uh, the progress they made in the off season. Now we just got to see in spring camp where or what it all looks like on the field. So I got to think with your coverage of my man, Buddy Pugh at South Carolina State, you had to see Jawan Howell play. Yes, I mean, Jawan Howell, yes. He is a dude, right? Dude. I mean, tell our listeners and viewers uh, live on YouTube what South Carolina is getting from what you saw of Jawan Howell, who was the – MEAC, freshman of the year, led the team in rushing. I'm pretty sure led the MEAC in rushing. Yes. Dude, dude's the truth, man. I mean, and, and like, and I would go down to, to the SEC State every almost, I would try to go down there as many Mondays as I could to talk to Buddy. That's when he had his uh, press conferences. And every week he would just tell us, man, man, Juwan, he's, he's so good. And we're so worried that we're going to lose him uh, to the portal because he knew what ultimately was going to be out there and the opportunities that were going to be out there for him. But man, I mean, you talking about a guy who averaged seven and a half yards a carry on like 183 carries this year. I mean, that's mind boggling. And he, no matter the level, that's somebody who just has vision. You, you know, if you, you're doing that as a freshman, you're, 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 you're wet behind the ears, you know, just going in there, just, just, just playing. And you're able to do that seven and a half yards carry, like I said, over 180 carries. It's not like you yeah, only had five or ten carries on the season. No, you were getting a lot of reps and you were balling out with it and making the most out of your opportunities. So yeah, he is he is a dude, and that was a big get uh for for, for Shane. Um and, and yeah, like I said, I, I love what they did with the running back position. They knew okay, we have a lot, a lot of improvement needs to be made at this position because we probably lost, in my opinion, lost like two or three games last year where, hey, if you had some form of a running game, you 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 could have won this game. But you, you put it all on Spencer, and that's tough. That's going to be tough for anybody, no matter how great you are, right? It, it's going to be tough to just be that one-dimensional. You know? And, yeah, by getting Jawan, like I said, getting Rocky, getting the other guys they were able to get, they they address that need in a big time way. But yeah, Juwan, yeah, that he's a dude. He's a dude for sure. 
an ascending dude. He's only a sophomore, so he's only going to get better. No doubt. Well, Chandler, I can't thank you enough. Great stuff as always. We yes, always sir. enjoy our conversations, and uh, can't wait to circle back later down the road and continue talking Gamecock sports and it's basketball season 30 days to Gamecock baseball yeah. I know you guys have got it covered um, have a great rest of the week and uh, many thanks my friend yes sir thank you Keith as always yeah we'll talk soon all right that was Chandler Mack from WLTX channel 19 in Columbia, so let's go into the Nana's Porch chat box. And uh, my man Antonio says Cardoso has the skill set. She's does not have the level of aggression. I I agree. I wish she would be more aggressive. I wish she would want to dominate like Aaliyah Boston wanted to dominate. Was she selfish? No. But she wanted to dominate. Asia Wilson wanted to dominate. Cardoso, quite frankly, is maybe quicker, longer, maybe more athletic. I mean, she can run like a gazelle. She has a skill set. She can shoot the mid-range jump shot. We saw just one. Dawn Staley's been begging her to shoot it. Um, Antonio, again, I agree. You want, When you get the ball with your back to the basket, you want to keep it high. You want to feel where the defense is, and that's going to dictate your move. But you want to – Keep it up. Don't bring it down where the guards can get in there and dig it out. I mean, you just don't want to do that. Uh, as far as our conversation on the run game, I do expect it to be better. Jared chimes in and says it can't be much worse. Uh, in the run game, I agree. I think Carolina only averaged like 89 yards per game. I mean, let's face it, Mario Anderson was pretty good, but he was going to be third team probably at best this year, maybe fourth team. Um, I mean, I thought he got some bad advice going in the portal, not taking the money, going, you know, then he ends up going to Memphis. You know, Jalen Nichols thought he was going to go to North Carolina. They wound up getting another dude. He winds up, I think, at Memphis. Um, they got bad, bad advice, but the Gamecocks, I like, uh, the transfer portal additions. I think, you know, since you did not have the money to spend on a starting quarterback, like a KJ Jefferson, like, uh, Malik Murphy, from Texas, who you brought on campus, like the five-star from Southern Cal who's going to Boise State. I mean, you would have liked to thought you could have beat Duke and Boise State, but the reason you couldn't was you weren't promising, you know, or even Central Florida, you weren't promising those guys they were going to start, right? I mean, look, Dow Loggins – He's coached quarterbacks in the NFL. He's seen great quarterbacks. He's seen bad quarterbacks. He was at Arkansas for two years with K.J. Jefferson. I mean, if he thought South Carolina needed to go all in on a starting quarterback, they could have invested in that. I think we have to trust him because he was around Lenore Sellers every day, and he is a dude, but he's still going to be a young redshirt freshman. There are going to be some growing pains. It's really not ideal. You know, uh, somebody asked me uh, on our premium uh, chat on Patreon uh, in the Cockaboose Lounge about, 
you know, should we be worried if uh, Robbie Ashford's a starting quarterback? Well, yeah. Now, if Lenora Seller struggles during the season, could you see him, you know, stand on the sideline for a couple series or if he gets banged up? Is Robbie Ashford going to be okay? I think Dowell Loggins can develop him as a passer. He's a career 50% passer. You know, same amount of touchdowns as interceptions. That's not ideal. And so you hope you can make him a one and a half or two touchdown to one quarterback guy, a guy that's not 50%, but maybe that's 60%. I would have preferred A.J. Swan because it's easier to take out the quarterback run game in your offense if you have a really accurate passer than it is to bring in a guy that's not that accurate, but he's just a runner, then you become more one dimensional. So hopefully Ashford improves. He's given the opportunity to improve. Um, You know, Dante Reno is a very talented player who came in. He's on campus now. I mean, look, Trevor Lawrence was god-awful in the All-America Bowl. I mean, he threw a pick six. Like his first throw in that game was a pick six. It happens. I do think South Carolina has made a lot of upgrades on the roster. I do think Robbie Ashford's better uh, than at least one of the quarterbacks you lost. To the portal, the other one's giving up football. So, I mean, you definitely signed three dudes at running back. As far as the net loss at wide receiver, you're not replacing Xavier Leggett and you didn't bring in Juice Wells. Not yet. Okay, you did bring in three portal guys uh, that are talented. I like all three of them. Gage, Larva Dane, uh, is probably a slot guy, but so is Jared Brown, Amari Huggins, Bruce. I do think you'll see South Carolina try to get one to two more portal wide receivers. Um, you also have DeBron Gatling, who was in the Under Armour All America game. You bring it in, Mazio Bennett. Uh, you know, Jared says. If Michigan loses Harbaugh, do they have a mass exodus? Well, I think that depends on who you hire. If they promote Sharon Moore, I don't think they have a mass exodus. Will some players check their market value on the portal? Sure. Now, if they bring in General Brian Beauregard Kelly from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, they probably will have a mass exodus. So will LSU. Um, I mean, that could just set off a whole nother chain reaction. Then what if Lane Kiffin goes to LSU, then Ole Miss? Think about all those guys they brought in from the transfer portal, the number one transfer portal class. I mean, dudes, Juice Wells, not even really one of their top five or six transfers and he was the top wide receiver in the SEC last year. So, um, you know, for me, outside of the three running backs, I think you did it as best you could at quarterback with Ashford. Like I said, I would have preferred A.J. Swan stick with Carolina. I do like the wide receivers. I think they all kind of remind me of – you know, when you had Nicky Jones and Bruce Ellington and Ace Sanders, they were pretty doggone good, right? They struggled against press coverage because they were all small, small guys. You need, you know, Nicholas Harbor to develop. You need the, you know, Tyshawn Russell, who's not the biggest guy in the world. You need your freshman to make a move, but I do know of at least one wide receiver. I feel fairly confident. It's a bigger wide out that will come home after he graduates from his present school, at least as of today. 
I think they got one of the top tight ends in the portal in Brady Hunt. Obviously, you have to say that when Texas A&M is trying to get him to flip. Uh, I love Torricelli Simpkins, the center from North Carolina Central, played for my dude Cedric Williams. Uh, says, without a doubt, Simpkins is a day one starter in the SEC. Not just at South Carolina, but in a lot of places um, for sure. So I really like him. I really like adding Kyle Kennard from Georgia Tech and Gilbert Edmond. Gilbert Edmond was a very productive player um, at South Carolina before he left. He found out the grass is not always greener on the other side. In 10 starts, after that Arkansas game in 2022, Jordan Strong got injured. Edmund was a younger player. 39 tackles, nine tackles for loss, two sacks. Uh, was really good towards the end of the year. Really good against Tennessee and Clemson. Then went to Florida State. It didn't work out. You know, he only started the Orange Bowl after the mass exodus. They had some NFL dudes ahead of him. He's coming back. I think him and Kennard and veterans that have played a lot of ball that are a lot probably more athletic than the guys that were at the position last year. Um I mean, let's just be honest. I mean, I think Desmond Yumi Azulu is very athletic. I don't think we saw the best version of JT Gear because of the high ankle sprain he suffered late in fall camp. He was never 100%. And you're bringing also bringing in Dylan Stewart, who's the college ready and the best pass rusher in the country in that position. You, you put – those guys on the field, along with Elijah Davis, who's going to be a lot better. I mean, all of a sudden you're looking at, you know, Desmond Yumi Azulu. You're looking at Elijah Davis. You're looking at JT Gear. You're looking at Kyle Kennard. You're looking at Gilbert Edmond. And you're looking at – Dylan Stewart, Brian Thomas Jr., maybe he can play linebacker. I mean, that's six, six, seven deep right there. Uh, I love what they did at linebacker. I think when you add the two freshmen who are elite, you add Bengali uh, Kamara and uh, Demetrius Knight, you're faster, you're more athletic, you're more productive, you're deeper. Jaron Willis is back. Debo Williams is back. Wendell Gregory and Fred Johnson are dudes. You're deeper, faster, more athletic. Um, I wish they would have signed one or two elite corners, but they did not. So uh, they did add Gerald Kilgore, another safety. At corner, it's OD Fortune and Young Guys. And it's the second year in a row they've not upgraded. But they're not finished. 21 out, 18 in, a big upgrade. Do I have question marks about some of the guys they brought in? Yes. You know, you're looking at Aaron Parks, who really did not play very much at Oklahoma. Can he get on the field? Because South Carolina's returning a lot of guys. They're, they've got very young, talented offensive tackles. How does he fit in? You know, uh, Kelly Goodwine from Alabama, a four-star guy from the DMV. Really didn't play a whole lot. Just like Parks, a four-star from the DMV. He's got two years. Can, can Travia Robertson develop him 
as a depth piece. I love DeAndre Jules. I won't be shocked if he's not even a starter. Um, you know, but I do have questions about a couple of those guys. But I think you brought in a lot more players than you lost, even though you didn't want to lose Pup Howard, you didn't want to lose Stone Blanton. I do think you upgraded over those guys um, because they were developmental players. And I also think Pup Howard's a defensive end. He just is. So, um, you know, probably the bit, yeah, I, I do like the late addition on the offensive line of Kamar Bell. He's a three year starter. Okay. You, you're losing Ja'Kai Moore, who is a veteran guard. You're adding a guy there. You pro brought in a guy that's probably going to start at center for you. I think, uh, you know, Josiah Thompson, if he picks up 30 pounds between now and August, he's just going to be too good at some point. You know, maybe that frees up, you know, you to move Tree Babalade to right tackle. It's going to be interesting. They got choices. I can't wait for spring practice. And then after spring, there'll be another round of the portal. There'll be more guys leaving and more guys coming in. But I do think South Carolina is more talented when you consider the 18 guys in, the 12 guys from high school, but you are losing two difference makers really three difference makers in Spencer Rattler, Xavier Leggett, and Juice Wells. Three difference makers. How many difference makers will step up? How many difference makers did you bring in? You upgraded your overall talent. Who are the difference makers going forward? That's the question for Shane Beamer. I think he's upgraded his staff. I just don't think there was no way you were letting Ontario Hardesty have Rocket Sanders, Juwan Howell, Attaway, you know, DJ Braswell, Matthew Fuller. I mean, that is a heck of a running back room for sure. Um, I think you upgrade on your defensive line, particularly at edge. You know, I'm interested to see how Jules and Goodwine fit in. You increase your athleticism at linebacker, two experienced older guys and two high, high ceiling linebackers in Wendell Gregory and Fred Johnson and then Dylan Stewart. I mean, big time. Addition there, I think Jalewis Solomon can be your nickel, could be a third corner. I know this. They think he is a day one starter somewhere. Is that at corner? Is it at nickel? I hope it's at nickel so you don't have to play, you know, a safety against a slot receiver. We'll see. Uh, I thought there could be – there could have been more – Coaching changes, there may be. Um, I would expect if Justin Stepp can find a job, he will be gone uh, because I don't think he wanted to coach tight ends. And if he can't find a job, I think after this year, it'll be his last year at South Carolina. I think he is a great dude who, I mean, it's a results-oriented business and the recruiting has not been what it needs to be. So that is going to be a wrap for today. No basketball until the weekend. We'll be breaking it all down. We'll be waiting on that contract for Markwell Blackwell. And we'll be monitoring the coaching carousel. Is it still spinning? Jim Harbaugh interviewing with – the Chargers, which is where I think he's going with the Falcons, which is where I wish he would go. 
as much of a legend as Bill Belichick is, I know he only needs 15 games to become the winningest coach in NFL history. I think Arthur Blank wants that to be with the Atlanta Falcons. The Falcons need a quarterback, and Belichick, since Brady's been gone, has screwed the pooch at New England at quarterback. Do you make a trade? Do you trade him to the Bears for Justin Fields? Do you move up in the draft? Do you do you go get Drake May or Caleb Williams? Do you sacrifice a bunch of number ones? Because outside of that, you got the roster to win now. Um, do you hope? You know, Jaden Daniels falls to you at eight. I don't know. Those are all questions that will not happen probably until after the Super Bowl and the, the draft is not until April. So that's going to be a wrap. I'll be back uh, tomorrow. I'm headed uh, for the doctor's office to try to get some medicine. Thanks to everybody. I know I was a little nasally today, but special thanks to my dude, Chandler Mack, one of the best in the business. I'll be back tomorrow and Friday on Gamecock Pod Daily. Go Gamecocks, and God bless all of you. I'm out of here.